Hey, what's up Nerdgasm fans? Jerry here, AKA Barnacles, and today we're unboxing my brand new cell phone. Yeah, it's, it's not an iPhone 6. As you can clearly tell by the amazing packaging. Nope, this is actually the one plus one. So I guess technically that makes it the two. And by two, I hope they don't mean number two because if this thing sucks, Logan from Tech Syndicate. I'm gonna come looking for you. All right, well, let's go ahead and unbox this bad boy and see if it bends. Bend. Guys, I'm totally kidding. It's not an iPhone 6. It's, it's obviously not gonna bend. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here I have it. This is the one plus one. Now, the interesting thing about it when I received it is it's in this like square flat cardboard box with no graphics on it whatsoever. It just says standalone black and one plus one on it. Also, before I open this up, I wanna make one thing clear, okay? The joke about the iPhone 6 bending is just that. It's a freaking joke. If you try to bend any cell phone, I don't care which one it is, one of two things is gonna happen. It's gonna bend or it's gonna break. I'm sorry, but we haven't discovered adamantium yet. Now, Logan from Tech Syndicate came and found me at World Maker Fair and showed me his OnePlus One, and he was the one that convinced me that I should give Android another try, because I've given him a try in the past, and to be honest, I haven't been that impressed. This better change that. All right, well, let's open her up. It looks like it's got a little place here where you pull and rip across, but they covered it in plastic, so you know what that means. No, 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 all right, well, so much from not caring about the packaging, the nice box is inside of the, the shitty box. And the shitty box and the charger came inside of another brown box. It's like, how many freaking boxes do you need? Ugly box, pretty box. Ugly box, pretty box. All right, well, I'll be damned. That actually is a pretty box. It looks like a little book slid into a case. And on the back, it says, Sandstone Black, 64 gigabytes capacity, global version. Includes the phone, the USB cable, and a SIM injection tool. And it's supported on LTE, GSM, and WC DMA networks. All right, it's got a little uh, tab here. We're gonna go ahead and pull on. And there we go, we got another box inside of a box. Starting to feel like this is a Russian doll. Oh my gosh, look at that. I opened it up and there is a phone in there. All right, that was the dumbest thing I've ever said. I'm, I'm gonna edit that out. Just kidding, ain't nobody got time to edit that stuff out. All right, it looks like we have another little tab here to pull the phone out. And the first thing I noticed is it's uh, it's actually pretty lightweight. It looks like the front's got a protective covering on it that you can peel away. And the thing's already powering up. I must have accidentally bumped one of the buttons on the side. Now, the texture on the back of this thing, at least the one I got, it feels like fabric. It's got, it's got a very, very kind of, I don't know, soft but gritty fabric texture. And the very first thing it's asking me after powering it up is which network I want to get on. Well, Barna Vista, of course. All right, now it's telling me that I need to insert the SIM in the phone. So I'm gonna go ahead and transfer my SIM card over to this now. Now it said in the box there was a SIM removal tool and there it is right there. That's cute, it even comes in its own little sheath that you can put on your keychain. That's, they must think people swap out their SIMs a lot. All right guys, so here I have my old iPhone 5S. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the SIM out of here so I can put it in the new phone. So I'm gonna use their SIM puller. Houston, we have a problem. It appears that the SIM that's in my iPhone is a smaller SIM than what this thing requires. Well, guess what guys? I just realized something. I have a freaking 3D printer. I can just print an adapter for the SIM card. Well, this officially has to be the new smallest thing I've ever 3D printed, and I'm completely shocked, but check this out. The little SIM pops right in the tray, snap, snap pops right into the other little tray for the phone. And she slides right in. And there you have it, five bars. Well guys, that might seem pretty insignificant, but the fact I was able to print something so small to adapt that little nano SIM to the micro SIM slot, I mean, that, that, that blows my mind. And it works. All right, well, let's go ahead and set that aside for a moment. We're gonna open up the power box. We can get Bat Knife back. Oh yeah, Bat Knife. No, 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 Bat Knife, Bat Knife. Slider out. <laughs> and there you have a very Apple-esque looking charger. And it also came with a USB cable, and this thing is awesome. It's got, a, it's a flat cable. It's not a round cable. Not very long. But it's got that USB tip on it where it's very, very minimalistic design. It's not gonna snag on things and get dirty. Ta-da, charger. Charger. 
All right, what's up guys? During that slight little delay you experienced, two days have passed. As you can see right here, it is now Saturday, October 11th. Well, originally I was gonna do just a first thoughts on this phone, but then I figured, you know what? I've done Android before and now I'm about to do it again, so I want to do a very in-depth analysis for you guys, and mainly for me because I have to live with this thing. All right, well, let's talk about the physical phone just a little bit. I really, really like the design and I love the way that it fits in your hands. It's actually a very large screen, yet it's still easy to operate with just one hand because the back texture on the phone really, really grips you. You don't feel like with an iPhone, it's gonna just slip out of your hands, which I really like. It's also great if you have wet or damp hands, say from working out or just walking upstairs for us fat guys. You know what I'm saying. Also, the button placement on the phone is really good. The buttons are all off on the sides here and they don't catch on your pocket when you're putting them in and out of your pocket, which is nice. And you don't find yourself accidentally clicking them. They put them high enough up on the phone that when you're holding it by the bottom here, you're not constantly clicking all the buttons. Now that's a big problem I had with the Lumia 1520. That thing you were always hitting the buttons because they were all down the side of the phone. The only other phone I've seen with a screen even close to this is the Lumia 1520 has a very, very similar look and feel to it. It's just a larger screen. So because this is a smaller screen sporting the same resolution, which is 1080p native, it just looks that much sweeter. Reading tiny text on this thing is amazing. I also liked how they rounded the back of the phone. It definitely gives it more of a thinner feel, even though it's not actually that thin. You put it next to say an iPhone 5, even though it's an overall smaller phone, it's actually thicker laying on a desk than an iPhone 5, but it's not thicker at the edge. And when you're feeling it in your hand, that's exactly where you notice it. So it definitely feels like a very thin phone. I think overall, it's a brilliantly beautiful design, but it does have a couple cons to it. Now, one of the cons, and it's true for most Android phones, is the buttons at the bottom are not physical. Your little menu button, home button, and back buttons, they're all touch screen. Now, in their defense, they did a good job with the software where you're not always touching them. You don't always accidentally bump into them. Even when I was playing games like this, I found that I wasn't running into problems, which is great, because on the Lumia, with those buttons at the bottom, I am always hitting those damn things. Also, it does have a removable back cover, but it's a bitch to get off this phone. Put it this way, I gave up. I have not taken the back off this phone because I got like two things unclipped and I realized there's about four billion more clips on it and I just gave up. And I don't know why you'd wanna take the back off unless you were gonna change the color because there's not a serviceable battery. Well, I shouldn't say that. You could probably service it with tools, but you can't swap the battery and it doesn't have an SD card expansion. So there's really no reason to take the back off. Now, my only other pet peeve with the physical aspects of this phone is the orientation. If you look at the phone top to bottom, it looks, I mean, it looks the same at first glance. You can until you can see the earpiece just a little bit up here. But for the most part, I found when I take it out of my pocket, because there's buttons on both sides and they're at the same height, I have a hard time from feel telling where it is. So I pick it up off my desk all the time. And I'm like, oh, no, it's upside down. I didn't have this problem with the iPhone 5, which is strange because if you look, the iPhone 5 is very, very similar, except for it doesn't have buttons on one side so that when you reach in and feel, you can always feel those buttons and it's a dead giveaway of the orientation. Now this might not be a pet peeve for anybody else, but I just noticed after using it heavily for two days, there was more than half a dozen times where I pulled the phone out and it was upside down and I was wondering why it wasn't turning on when I was hitting the speaker up and down. All right, let's go ahead and get call quality out of the way. I literally called myself on my home phone and talked to myself with the phone on the other ear. And I also called my wife's cell phone and the home phone with my wife answering to see what she thought. And her comments were verbatim, this sounds like you're talking to me from a landline. She said, my iPhone, it's always completely apparent when I call her on the iPhone, what it sounds like. But with this, she said that it sounded just like I was calling her from a high-end home line and that the microphone sounded amazing on it. And I kind of confirmed that when I shot some video later on and I listened to the audio, it definitely has a phenomenal microphone. Also, the earpiece gets incredibly loud. So if you're in a noisy environment, you can get a lot of volume going into your ear, which helps a lot. Now, I did notice if you move your ear away from the phone, there's like a certain spot where you get a little bit of a reverberation uh, when you have the volume cranked up all the way, but as long as you keep it pressed against your ear or out away from your ear, you're fine. All right, well, we talked about the hardware. Now let's talk about the software because that's where this really is a special phone and that is it runs Android. Now everybody knows the top three contenders right now would be iOS, Android, and Windows phone, sort of, kind of. And I've owned and used all three of those phones. I have a Lumia 1520 that I used for a while. I ultimately stopped using it because there's just no good apps in the marketplace and it just has massive problems with its applications. The OS on it is solid and it feels like a great experience and the phone takes beautiful pictures. I'll just say that right now. Oh my God, that Lumia 1520 is like a little DSLR. But the software is a deal breaker. So everybody knows that the software is probably the most important part of the phone. Now, I've used Android before and I had mixed experiences with it and I still do. I have a Nexus, I have two Nexus 7s, I have a NVIDIA Shield. So I'm no 
stranger to Android. And, but back when I tried to use it as a phone, it was a horrible experience and I just had massive problems with applications. Nothing worked, the OS was really fidgety and it made for a bad experience. And I'm pleasantly surprised that a lot of that has changed, but there's still a couple little quirks there. Well, let's talk about the positive aspects of Android. And specifically, we're talking about Cyanogen, which is basically the default build that comes on the OnePlus One. But you can also install any ROM you want on it. That's the one of the beauties of this phone, is when you're using iOS and you're using Windows Phone, you're either running vanilla Windows Phone or you're running vanilla iOS. Unless you jailbreak it, then you have a little bit of flexibility, but still not infinite flexibility. With Android, J they don't even call it jailbreaking, they call it rooting. It's, it's very, very similar, but the main difference is Android devices are pretty much designed to be rooted. The, rooting these things is completely okay. It's actually a supported scenario. You go to the OnePlus One forums and people tell you how to root it, how to run certain things. Even the marketplace has applications designed to run on rooted phones. The whole ecosystem supports that scenario. Whereas with an iPhone, the second you jailbreak it, Apple sends the black helicopters to kill you. Not really, they don't do that, but still, you kind of get what I'm saying. You can even enable developer tools by going into settings. You have to basically go down here, go to your about phone, scroll down the bottom, find the build number. You know, it's a little bit cryptic. You gotta tap it a whole bunch of times. Then it's like, oh my God, you're a developer. But the cool thing about that is now you have access to tools to show you the frames per second that you're getting in games. You can actually enable things to give more CPU or less CPU to apps. Basically, the Android community and the OnePlus One community are just trusting you to play around with things and figure it out. Now granted, that's more of a power user experience. I would not recommend this phone to anybody but a power user. That goes for any Android phone. I'll tell you why later. I also love that you can plug a USB cable into it, into the computer, and it just shows up as a storage device under Windows or OS X. You can, you can literally just go through the folders like music and video and all those and just basically copy your files directly across just like it was a plug-in hard drive. I prefer that so much to the scenario of having iTunes where it controls everything you do and the types of files you can put on your device. I can copy anything to this. I can use it as a 64 gig hard drive if I want. I did, however, find that it's very finicky about the cables you use. I tried five different USB cables and they all charged the phone okay, but they wouldn't establish a data connection to the computer. I literally had to use their USB cable to get a data connection. Now, I don't really know why that is yet. It's gonna take a little more investigation. Maybe those other five cables I have are literally just shitty cables. Now, if you do like the sync experience, don't worry, they haven't forgot about you. There's several programs out there that you can use. There's one called Double Twist. It's just a free app you install and it basically, you select all your options. Every time you plug your device in, it resyncs your music libraries and your videos and all that stuff. So you basically get all the functionality of iTunes. Now the widgets are the thing that I think are really cool on this phone. I like, like here I have a little widget that shows me information on reviews and stuff that are going on. I have my weather over here and I have the time and the date. Um, I also have all my social networking applications right next to it. So I can just unlock my phone and I can see this. I even installed a little bar on one of the desktops that let me quickly enable and disable Bluetooth networking and all that stuff. And I think that that's really convenient to have it there. And the really cool thing about the widgets is unlike the Windows phone where you have that live tile where you can show some information and do some things, these are way more configurable. You can literally make these the entire size of the screen if you want to. You can even have them put like individual little things over the desktop and overlay things. It's just Android trusts you a lot more to manipulate the operating system. That also comes with some cons though, definitely. Another thing I really liked was the notification center. You pull it down, it shows you all your notifications for each of the apps. If you take a picture, somebody posts a picture or somebody messages you, it shows you their picture. I found it just to be a lot more verbose than the one on iOS. And I like it personally because it shows me the names of like every single person who currently has a message on deck for me on Twitter and then it truncates it after a while. Holy crap, that is some hail. You guys hear that? Sounds like my house is gonna blow down. Wow, it is pouring cats and dogs out here. I also like that in Notification Center, you just have one button here and you can clear all the notifications. Another really cool feature is if you wanna do multitasking, you just hold down the little menu button down at the bottom, they all pop up and see every app that you have running. And if you want, you can individually kill them or you can literally just kill them all by pushing that button. I really like the kill all feature because sometimes you open up so many things on your phone, it starts getting sluggish and unresponsive. It's just eating up all your memory and you just wanna start clean, so boom. Gone. I also love the level of interaction between applications. For instance, if I open up Twitter and I wanna tweet a photo, I can literally select, I want a file photo. It'll take me to all of my file system options to select a photo. I can select which app I wanna take the photo with. So if I wanna take the photo with like paper photo, or I wanna take the photo with the inbox camera application, I can select each one of those. And I can even tell the app whether I wanna use that every time 
or if I wanna personally select which app I wanna use every time, which is my personal preference. Now, on an iPhone, you can drop out, go open the other app, take the picture, save the picture, drop out, go back to the other app, open the picture and post it, but I find that it's a lot more fluid experience when I say just go to the app, take the picture, and then boom, it just shows up. It's very, very nice. I also really, really like the back button down here. So if you open up an application, like let's go ahead and open up Twitter. Now let's say somebody inside Twitter, like Nerdist.com just posted something. I can click the link and it opens up the web page that I can go to. Now all I have to do is just hit the back button and now I'm right back where I left off. In iOS, I go to the link, it goes back, I have to hit the home button, then go back to the application that I wanna to go to. I like the fact that the back button literally takes you back through each and every step that you did and it works everywhere, which I think is really cool. There's been so many times on the iPhone where I'm like, I click a link, it takes me out of Twitter, I click another link, it takes me out of YouTube, then I gotta click, go to the desktop, double click, swipe over and go to the app that I wanted to go to. I like this because now I can go, click a link, follow it to another link, follow it to another link, follow it to another app that follows to another link to another app, so on and so forth, and just back, 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 I'm right back where I started. It's genius. All right, so now let's go with some of the cons on it. The scrolling still doesn't feel as good as iOS. If you go into an application and you scroll around, for the most part it's smooth, but you can see it kind of hiccups, 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 it kind of, it kind of pauses and stuff, and it also doesn't feel like it's that same physics-based scrolling. Like on an iOS device, when you scroll, you get, you get more of a rubber banding effect uh, when you scroll, the rate at which it slows down and the drag on the screen, it's, I don't know, it's just a lot smoother. I can't really explain it beyond that. You can use the devices side by side and look for yourself, but it's definitely a smoother scrolling experience. I find that on Android, the scrolling experience can change pretty drastically from app to app, whereas on iOS, it seems like it's a more fluid and unified experience. I also encountered a, quite a few crashes. A lot of people got mad when I was posting on Twitter saying, I've never had a crash on my Android device. Well, bullshit. If you have had a crash on your Android device, you're not using it. Because I used Twitter, I used, my, I used the Chromecast, the Facebook, Hootsuite, all those apps, and in two days, now granted, I used it heavily. I went through two full batteries on this thing, just about. And uh, I can tell you right now, I had about seven crashes. Here, let me show you some of them. Now, granted, every single one of the crashes recovered. I didn't have to physically reboot the phone, which was great. On past Android versions, I had massive OS breakdown where I had to reboot the device to get it back. So far, I haven't had to reboot the device to get it back. It's all been like app level crashes. And I have experienced the occasional hang too, where the UI is just like, ah, I'm not talking to you anymore for a little while, but it always came back. And the only other real con that I saw uh, to using Android over say iOS is that it is a completely open platform. That is both a pro and a con in itself, meaning you can get viruses, you can get malware. If you're careful and you only use the Google Play Marketplace and you read descriptions and you read that stuff and you're not just blindly clicking and downloading everything to your phone, you'll be fine. You're never gonna have a problem. But do realize that on this phone, applications can do things they can't do on iOS. They can talk to each other. They can access your file system. They're not, they're not cordoned off and cornered off from talking to each other. That is a huge benefit and reason to have this phone, but also if you're not responsible, it can really, really screw you bad. Think of this more like your desktop PC, because it really is. You can do just about anything. You can even download apps to sync PS3 controllers and Nintendo Wii controllers to it. You can get a cable so you can plug it in here and you can actually use it for like connecting hard drives and other hardware. If you root the device, you can even install drivers on it to interact with proprietary stuff. It's awesome. All right, so in a nutshell, you guys probably already know, but Android is infinitely configurable. If you want an OS on your phone that rivals your Windows operating system as far as configurability and doing whatever the hell you want to do with it, Android is the way to go. But just realize it does come at a cost. You know, it's going to take a little bit of figuring out to get the right balance of apps and the right balance of settings where your system's 100% stable. And it will be if you do it right. It's just if you're willy-nilly installing apps and doing stuff and jumping back and forth and screwing with settings and combination stuff, you're gonna see some crashes and hangs. You just are. And let's also be clear, iOS isn't bulletproof. I've experienced crashes and hangs on iOS too, just not to the same frequency I have on this throughout the same usage patterns. All right, let's talk about the camera. The camera is hugely important to me. I'm a social networking guy, I do YouTube, I need a good camera. And the camera on this is a 13 megapixel Sony sensor, which is supposed to be fantastic. You know, I'll just throw it out there. On, on paper, it looks absolutely amazing. And the front facing camera, I believe is a five megapixel camera. And it's also really amazing, especially in low light. But there is a caveat. I'm gonna say right now that the picture quality is nowhere near as good as it was on the iPhone 5S, which was a way less <laughs> megapixel sensor. So I wasn't expecting that. I looked at a bunch of pictures and the determination that I came to was one, the saturation and white balance is way off. You have to correct for those things for every picture that you take. 
Um, I don't know why it doesn't have a good white balance. That kind of threw me off. Like the pictures on this do not look as rich and the color does not look as accurate as it did on my iPhone 5S. Also, there is a massive amount of noise in the pictures. When you, even when you take one of the raw images or you take it at 100% image quality, at the same setting, well, relative settings, you don't have the same granular control on the iPhone as you do on this. You can literally on this, you can change the megapixels you're recording the image at, you can change the quality and the compression, you can even tell it you wanna record a raw image. So you have way more camera control. And if you take your time and you set up your picture and you mess with all those settings, you might get a really good picture. But just out of the box, point and click auto mode, not nearly as good. The pictures are way too noisy. Now keep in mind, you can fix a lot of that noise and overly sharp image in Photoshop or a processing suite like that. But when you're just wanting to post pictures to Instagram and Facebook, the iPhone definitely had the better camera experience overall. Now, as far as video goes, you guys got to see a little video clip earlier on of it at 1080p, but this will do 4K video, but I also saw the same problem with the video and that is at 4K, I saw a lot of noise. You'd have to add post-processing and Adobe Premiere or your editor of choice to smooth that out. And once it's smoothed out, it'll probably look phenomenal because a 13 megapixel center sensor is just awesome. But realistically, to somebody who has a phone and just wants to take a picture and post it on the web or just take a video and send it to their friends, I didn't think the quality on this was really that good, guys. And I've read a lot online where people are saying that the camera's amazing and they post amazing pictures taken with this thing. I'm just saying that's not what I've seen. In my usage patterns where I'm taking pictures side by side, I even took a picture earlier of something on my desk with the iPhone and then I took the picture on this, both auto settings. Here, let me show you that to you right now. Now, if you're looking at this picture, you can immediately see that it's not blown out on the iPhone. It's pretty blown out on the OnePlus One. And you can also see that it's it's pretty grainy on the OnePlus One. It's just, it's not as smooth. Now, granted, iOS might be doing a shitload of post-processing on those images when you're taking them. I honestly don't know. And they might even be doing the processing on the image preview, but the end result doesn't change. The iOS picture was much, much better. But I'm confident if I spend a whole day playing around with all the settings on exposure and ISO and all the stuff that this actually allows you to tweak, I'm sure I can get a good picture out of this. I also found a few bugs in the camera software and that is it lets you select image combinations that aren't compatible. Like I was able to select MP4 as my codec and I was able to basically go in and select 4K video together. And it's like, oh yeah, sure you can do that. Second I hit record, it pops up with a message saying, you can't do this, that's not a supported combination. Well, why didn't you gray out the options when I selected them? It doesn't make any sense. So there are little bugs like that littered throughout the operating system. They're not deal breakers. You can usually figure them out really, really quickly, but those aren't the general types of bugs that I run into on iOS, especially with the inbox application. I also noticed that the preview on this phone, when you're actually taking a video or taking a picture, depending on your settings and everything, the preview actually is pretty jerky. On the iPhone, the preview is smooth. You move it around when you're looking at the screen and you're moving around, it looks butter smooth. But for some reason on this, it just seems jerky. And depending on the combination of options that you select, it can get better or worse, but it's always jerky unless you're actually recording. In that case, it's smooth. All right, let's talk a little bit about the marketplace. Ultimately, that is one of the most important parts of the experience because it's where you get all your applications. It's where you find everything that you're gonna use. It's the center of the experience. It's one of the reasons I don't like the Lumia 1520 anymore is it's a fantastic phone, but the marketplace was just full of garbage apps. The apps that I did download didn't work right. I hated the YouTube app. I downloaded the YouTube app on Windows phone. It had no creator features whatsoever. So me as a creator of content, Whoever created that app didn't have me in mind at all. Yet in the Android app and the iOS app, they both have uh, functionality that's pretty much on par with the website and in some ways better. But the marketplace on Android is vast. It's very, very well organized through the Google Play Store. But the cool thing is you can actually install other apps to go to other stores and download apps from those and you pretty much get apps from anywhere. You're not locked down like you are on iOS getting apps from one place. Now granted, if you jailbreak on iOS, there's some other options and other marketplaces to get things. But on this, there's other legitimate marketplaces that you can actually go to and download things from if you want. I also love the way that it's laid out. When you go into like the sections like apps and games, the way everything's displayed, the way that the information is basically shown to you. When you click on the apps, I like when you go into it, it gives you a lot of information on have your friends used it, have your friends given it the plus one on Google Plus. Now finally, Google Plus actually has like a purpose when you're using one of these. And, uh, and, it, and you can even click on similar apps and it shows you similar apps that other users have downloaded to do the same thing. It's very, very well organized, very easy to traverse. You can also find a whole bunch of applications that require root level access. Now that's both a pro and a con. The cool thing is the store embraces it. You can download apps to sync your, your Nintendo Wii controller or your Sony PS3 controller, but they require the phone to be rooted and they say that in the app. So if you download it and your phone's not rooted, 
they just simply don't work. I also found some other apps that you download that just don't work. They just don't work at all. Since there's such a rich ecosystem of hardware out there that runs Android, that's both a blessing and a curse because these apps are not tested on every device. You can't test every app on every device, so you're bound to run into incompatibility. So read the text in the app description. Most of the top tier apps are tested across the board and work really good. But if it's one of the off the beaten path or new applications, you may run into problems, in which case this allows you to report them very, very easily and get them fixed. But what I absolutely love is that you can install Nintendo emulators and Sega emulators and emulators, emulators, emulators. I love emulators. They're probably one of my favorite things. Like for instance, right now I got Super G NES installed. This is from the marketplace. I didn't have to root, I didn't have to jailbreak or anything. And I happen to have the Super Mario World ROM. And there you go, Super Mario World running on my phone. So I found that all the emulators ran really good. The Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and even Nintendo 64 emulators all ran beautifully on this. Now you pair that with a controller and you've got yourself a really special experience. But I really love how the apps in the marketplace are way more open to interacting with the hardware on a whole level. iOS pretty much keeps the, the, the applications really isolated and doesn't let them get information from each other and do stuff like that. Android is much more open and gives much more lower level access to the hardware. So you can do things like sync up you know, Nintendo controllers and stuff to it. You can load drivers on it to interact with hardware that was never intended to be used with it. Because you can do those things, it inspires a whole new set of application development that you'll never see on iOS. Now granted, it also allows you to do a whole bunch of illegal shit. But hey buddy, that's, that's on you, okay? That's on you. Now the battery in this thing is actually pretty damn impressive. It's a 3100 mAh, if memory serves me correctly. And that's a pretty beastly battery for a phone. And I'll tell you right now, the first thing I did when I got the phone is I charged it up. I topped it off using the included charger. It took a couple of hours to get it topped off. It was already at half of a charge. And I used it for five hours straight laying in bed with Bluetooth enabled, full GPS, full Wi-Fi, everything, surfing apps, playing 3D games, going through the app marketplace, putting everything I could on, taking everything off. I was going buck wild for like five hours straight. And at the end of that, my battery was sitting right around 50%, which honestly is impressive as hell because my iPhone 5S, if I just turn the Bluetooth on, and I just, not even connect anything, just turn the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi on and put the screen at 100% brightness and set it down, the phone's dead in like two and a half hours. And another cool thing is this allows you to tweak the power management and you can go in and change all kinds of settings. Like you can put the GPS into low power mode so it's not as accurate, but it doesn't consume as much battery. Uh, you can put, install these little widgets and stuff to make disabling and enabling Wi-Fi a lot easier and a lot more straightforward. And airplane mode is instantly accessible just by pulling down the top here and you click that and just put it into airplane mode. Now everything's cut off and you're saving battery. So, and if you put the screen brightness in auto mode, it's gonna stretch that battery out anymore. So I think I finally found a phone that I can use my patterns because I'm also doing massive push notifications through Twitter and Facebook and all those things, which consume massive amounts of battery power. And I think I finally found a phone that might be able to go 24 hours without a charge. Fingers crossed. It is a radically different experience than using iOS. I'll tell you that right now. And moving from iOS wasn't easy. I had to go get a program called Contact Sync for $2.99 to basically export my exchange contacts since my exchange account wasn't good anymore. And in the end, it worked beautifully. But getting there was a little bit tricky. But now that I'm here, I think I'm gonna stay because I can live with the cons. I can live with the buggy operating system. I can live with the apps crashing every once in a while because what I get out of that experience is that the apps are capable of doing so much more than they were on iOS. And I can do things that I couldn't do on iOS. And truth be told, when I jailbroke my iPhone uh, years ago, it was way unstable after that. The experience was never that good. And I'm sure if you have a jailbreaked iPhone, you probably experience similar things. If you don't, you have the golden experience. You might want to publish a video of your own on here on how to create the perfectly jailbroken iPhone that's every bit as stable as before you jailbroke it. I dare you. But ultimately at the end of the day, the configurability sells this thing. Android is like a desktop operating system. You literally can think it, you can get the damn thing to do it and you discover new stuff that it can do all the time. iOS has a very bland look. Every iPhone you pick up when you turn it on, you're like, this is an iPhone. With Android devices, it's not like that. You could configure this thing to look like anything. As a matter of fact, I saw somebody posted uh, earlier, I think it was Sassy, uh, Sassy Geek, yeah, Sassy Geek on Twitter posted a picture of her Android that looked just like an iPhone. She actually installed a UI on it that looked just like an iPhone. Now, I don't know why anybody on earth would wanna do that because the iPhone UI is so dated, but still, it just goes to show the configurability of everything. And that's just too damn alluring to let go. So I am gonna make this my phone. I am not gonna get an iPhone 6, at least not yet. At some point in the future, I might give it a try because you never know. I mean, people change their minds. But last time I went to Android, I was convinced in one day that it was a steaming turd and that I didn't like it. And that's what ultimately drove me to iPhone. That's when I first started using iPhone was after that horrible Android experience. 
But to be honest, now it's stable enough. And now that I've figured it out and I've kind of grown with it over the next last two days heavily using it, I feel like I figured out the quirks and now the abilities that I get from using it far outweigh any of those quirks. And that's why I'm sticking with it. But at the end of the day, the OnePlus One, super solid phone, super, super fast. The price is phenomenal for what it is. And you don't have to buy a contract. You just buy the phone outright, jam your SIM in there and you're good to go. But I am gonna show you one interesting, funny thing that I found out about the phone. And this is for all you guys that made it to the end of this video. Here, I have a bottle cap. Here, I have my OnePlus One. Wait for it. <gasps> what? The magnet on these speakers is massive. It holds the bottle cap completely flat against the bottom on both sides. So you're probably not gonna wanna set this phone on top of your wallet. But in the interest of full disclosure, here's the iPhone 5. It also has a magnetic field, but it's not strong enough to hold the bottle cap. It just kind of grips it ever so gently and lets it go. So the iPhone does also have a magnetic field. Now the massive Lumia 1520 has a strong enough field to hold that down by the microphone at the bottom. So some phones have a stronger magnetic field than others, and it has to do with the magnet that's in the speakers internally. So I'd imagine all phones have a little bit of a magnetic signature, but it's pretty damn obvious that of the three phones, the One Plus One has the strongest magnetic pull at the bottom in two places that I've seen from any of the phones that I've tested. And I attribute that to it having huge speakers in it. Literally the speakers sound phenomenal on that phone. Of the three phones, the OnePlus One has the best sounding speakers, hands down, and the loudest. And that comes at a cost. You have to have a big ass magnet. But anything that's magnetic, I'd be curious to see if anybody's had an experience where it's wiped it. And the funny thing is, is I do have a memory when I went to New York to World Maker Fair, when I checked into the hotel, they told me not to set my cell phone on top of my door key. And I was like, why? Why would that make any difference? Why would wait? Well, now I know it's because the magnet in it can wipe it. And they've obviously had this happen before, but I'm sure some phones are worse offenders than others. All right, guys, well, I'm gonna wrap up this insanely long review of the OnePlus One. I give it a thumbs up. I think it's a phenomenal phone. Now I don't have to go hunt Logan down and kill him. He'll be thrilled to hear that. And it is an intriguing enough of an experience that I wanna stay with it and I don't wanna go back to iOS. iOS felt severely limiting to me. It felt like I could only do what the phone would allow me to do, not what I wanted to do. Also, if you have any questions or comments on this video, leave them down below and also come tweet me. I'm at Barnacles. And chances are, if you send me a tweet, I'm gonna see it because I am a Twitter whore. I mean like straight up Twitter whore. Hey, what's up, Logan? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I ended up liking the OnePlus One. It's actually a, a solid phone. And uh, so I'm not gonna have to come hunt you down and kill you. Yeah, I figured you'd be pretty thrilled about that. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. It helps me a lot. Also come over to Twitter. I'm at Barnacles. I'm a real social guy. Also, if you have a couple of minutes, check out some of these many other videos. I made them myself.